so here's my mom watching me have boyfriends, watching me have male friends, not having a single fucking conversation with me about who I am as I navigate all of this, lift me up with one hand, slam me down with the other. I think you're a whore. Basically, I'm paraphrasing what she said. And I remember where we stood when she said that in the stairs at the house, sunshine coming in, and my mom saying to me that she basically believes I'm fucking the town. And I remember how I felt in that moment. I rejected what she was saying wholeheartedly. And I was furious that she didn't see who I was. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that I just stood strong in my conviction of self, pushed back against the push down. Because if I had taken what she said, I would have called myself a whore. You know, the sooner we define ourselves, the 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 quicker we'll reject what people try to impose on us hello beautiful hi beautiful how are you i am so good so this is oh go first i was just gonna say i'm so excited about this look look what i'm ready for you have two of my books i do he has come back queen and no more assholes. Listen, I've had these books for a while because I am a marriage and family counselor. And so I run a couple singles group and a relationship group. And this is awesome. And so I'm eclectic. So I kind of combine, you know, my stuff with your stuff. And I have to say, I, I know you have structured here or maybe not, but like the, the kissing rule and all of that is like, spot on so I love your stuff totally supporting you oh my god so I didn't know this about you um I I came across you because of that story that I commented on that you you posted on TikTok about being on the plane with your crying baby and Mm -hmm. one came and said can I and she took care of your baby for you And it was such a beautiful heartwarming story. And there was something about that that drew me in. And what my brain said in that moment is I want to talk to her. Maybe I can help her. Okay. Well, I always need help, Chantel. (laughs) I always use some help. Um, Where do you want to go with that story? Do you want me to share it or? Yeah, I I want to start with you. Um, You have a relationship journey that is like, it's it's horrible yeah but it's also pretty common in a way like like to not not necessarily the details but that emotional journey is a little too common in our society today would you agree or disagree on that oh 100 percent. as a marriage counselor it's it's too common we've made it normal and we've minimized bad behavior and we really need to call it out if we want to see changes in, in the world, actually, not just our communities, but in our families and generations. But it's a world problem. It's a, I think it's an epidemic. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, I've gone through your TikToks and I've seen this story unfolding as, as you're talking about it. But can you bring us up to date, the rest of the people who don't know you and your story? So I don't know how far back you want me to go and I don't know, you know, where to stop, but, um, I was divorced. Um, it's been two years now, um, 20 years, 20 year marriage to a F-16 pilot. We were both in the air force and, you know, it's been hard. It's not supposed to happen to a marriage and family counselor because, you know, I've got all these qualifications. Surely I can't have a bad marriage, but you can when there's secrets. And so, Back up, you know, my story is childhood trauma. My mother was a prostitute and my father was a raging alcoholic. They never married. So I never really had an example in my home as to what a healthy relationship should be. Um, All I really was raised in was fear. I got more triggers than we can even talk about today. Even so, um, with meditation, it's just a process. Healing is a process. And, and so you take a girl that started drinking at 12, 12 years old to self-medicate and then marries at 17 for food to an abusive man, very abusive. And then decides, you know what? 
I don't want to do this anymore and joins the military. So you got this young girl who gets out of a marriage, who went through shelters, trauma, abuse with a drinking problem going into the United States Air Force. And so it's just like this recipe for complete disaster. And in that, in that time of, you know, being in the military, I got depressed, you know, I didn't realize I, I didn't know what to call it. It was trauma, PTSD, who knew those terms when you're a young teenager and whatnot. And so I just spiraled out of control with, you know, suicidal thoughts. And next thing you know, I find my freedom in that. And I launched my own ministry, my own counseling practice and wrote a couple books. Um, but there's a lot of dysfunction in relationships when you yourself are not healed, you seem to attract what you are. And there are predators who really seek vulnerable, broken people. So you have to be careful. There's red flags everywhere. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it, this resonates so much. It resonates with me. It resonates with people who are watching, resonates with the people who are listening. Because, you know, something that I say about myself is I am common. I'm, I'm like, were you relating to me when you were reading my books, Lovely? Absolutely. No, because you're real, you know? And so I love that you cuss, you know, I, you know, if you've read my, my TikToks and all that or watched them, you know, I'm a Christian. We might as well just throw that out there, but I'm a cussing Christian. Okay. So, <laughs> so I have no shame in that, you know, being in the military, you know, I look at everything as like being on the battlefield. And I feel like sometimes there's a lot of power in words and some people, there are going to be people that, you know, chime in and say, well, that's not godly. Well, here's the deal. We're on the battlefield together. And when you deploy to Afghanistan or Iraq, you know, you're using language out there because you're facing your enemy. Mm -hmm. And the way I see all of these things, it's like either we're going to win or we're going to lose and I want to win. And I can tell that you want to win, but you also want other people to win. And so I mean, if I had my own podcast right now, there's a thousand questions I'd want to ask you because where did this come from in, within you? Obviously, I know a little bit about you. Um, and so I believe it's our, there's purpose in pain. You have had pain as I have had pain. And the victory for both of us is what do we do with this pain? Are we going to help others or are we going to just like stuff it under a rug and be like, well, they can fend for themselves? That's not who you are, because yeah. if you were that way, you wouldn't have all these books, right? You obviously have a passion yes. to help people overcome. And I love that about you. Yeah. You know, and, and so I'll get to where this came from in a second. You and I are like so many other people mm -hmm. and they resonate with us because they come from this, this history of being in a home where you don't have the role models that you need being in a home where you've been stepped on. And so you are diminished as a person, having to fight your way to confidence and self-esteem and owning yourself as a person, taking control of your environment, no longer letting people do things that are bad to you. I left home at 17, got into a relationship myself to escape my mom only to get myself into another bad situation because we seek what's familiar, even if it's wrong for us, having to break those bonds of that mm -hmm. pattern of recreating toxic environment after toxic environment, because we don't know that something else even exists. Right. So we are attracted to the familiarity because it feels like home. Absolutely. Well, that's love, right? So I had an abusive dad and he was an alcoholic. And so guess what? My first marriage, abusive, verbally controlling and an alcoholic. Why? Because that's the love I saw in my family. That was love. Control, abuse was love. Yeah. And love isn't always functional. No, no, no. And the, the interesting thing is it's like love is so powerful. So you can love and hurt, or you can love and love. Mm. And so when you finally find the love and love piece, you don't settle for the love and hurt anymore because you finally have the experience. See, love is an experience. It's not something you say, I love you. It's an experience. And when you experience love, you can't explain love. You can't define it. You have to experience it. And so when you finally experience this great love, 
you never go back to, to a counterfeit love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I remember one time my husband, we fought for 10 years. We haven't had a fight in seven years now, but in those 10 years, uh, one time he's actually twice. <laughs> and then he stopped saying that he said, what are you going to do if we break up? Nobody's going to want to be with you. You're a stripper. And I said, I guarantee if we break up, I do better than you because that's what I do. I always level up. <laughs> well, certainly so. <laughs> and so, well, I think that's interesting because you're, you're not, so what you were a stripper, you know, at the end of the day, who cares? Like, I, maybe I was a stripper. I just didn't get paid for it. You know what I mean? Like we can all be, first, we can all be prostitutes at the end of the day. Some get paid, some don't. I mean, but it, what it's about is really understanding and developing who you are. I think your story about being a stripper can be used to help strippers. Yeah. I mean, so for me, it's like, there's nothing wasted under the sun. If we don't want it to be, it could be your superpower. Being a stripper can be superpower. Well, being a prostitute could be superpower. Being an addict can be superpower when you allow it to help other people. Mm -hmm. So you overcame, like you started off as a stripper, right? By the way, I have a twin sister. She was in the industry as well. Nice. Um, and so <laughs> funny, she used to ask me, hey, Mayor, she calls me Mayor, my name is Mary, and Mayor, you know, if we did this thing together. And so oh, yeah, <laughs> she, <I am. laughs> she I guess, right? And so, um, but my point is, I think that there are a lot of women that are stuck in shame because of that, or because of their addiction, or because of their abortion, or whatever. It says who? Yeah. You use these things for good when you write books like this to say, look, I didn't stay there or that that's not all I am. I'm so much more like I'm intelligent. I have purpose. I have value and I have an identity. And a lot of times we allow our trauma to define us or that man. I have such a problem and I'm not here to bash men on your podcast, but like women make man gods, like literally, like an idol. It's like, guess what? I just gave you power to determine my worth. That's the first problem. Yeah. You're not going to determine my worth. I get to determine my worth. And I've heard you say, you know, body counts and we get into so much stuff and it's so hypocritical because a man will judge a woman. He can have a hundred or so plus body counts, but if a woman does, oh no, you know, she's a hoe. We can't bring her home to mama. And it's like, there's this double standard that drives me bonkers. Mm -hmm. Equal. There is, you're not above and you're not below. We're supposed to be equal here. And so I love how you shed a light to all of that. There's a lot of double standards in the dating world. You're a dating coach. And I'm sure you see that all the time. Oh, definitely. I do. Um, definitely I do. And that, that's why we use a no kissing for three months dating rule. We let them talk. If they're one of those, we just don't select them. Yeah, I know you're so to the point. I'm like, I love this woman. She's just so to the point. You're like, no, goodbye next, you know? And so, but why do women, you know, and it boggles me, I'm sure as it boggles you, cause I'm in an office and I'm dealing with this stuff a lot. Yeah. It's like, they put up with so much. They, it's like they allow the lies. Yeah. And I believe a woman's gut instinct is 99% accurate. Mm -hmm. This thing that we have is a gift. Yeah. And if you think he's cheating or she's cheating, you know, because I don't want to just emphasize on the women. Men go through hell too. Women can be master manipulators. Women can be narcissists. And it's so it works both ways. So I try to play equal when I speak. But, you know, at the end of the day, we are permitting this behavior. And it will never change until we change something. Yeah. And, and I think the reason why they do that, like it, <clears throat> there's a variety of reasons why they would put up with it. There's fear. I'm afraid if I leave this relationship, I won't find someone else, right? There's certain qualities about this person that I'm afraid I'll never find somewhere else. And I've certainly been there myself, you know, looking at certain aspects of, of one person and saying, I doubt I can go find that exact same those aspects plus what I need, right? So I'm afraid if I let them go, I let go of these aspects forever. And another reason why they might be putting up with that is the cultural brainwashing that I'm actively undoing, which is a two-part brainwashing. Part one, you kiss a stranger just to find out who they are. 
So kiss and have sex and get the data after. You've developed emotions, which means you're committed, which means you're involved. Step two is the brainwashing that says fighting is normal, fighting is healthy. So they think they're in the right, the right relationship because they're told the chaos and dysfunction that's causing the fights is normal and healthy because you're supposed to be fighting. That's what a normal relationship is to the point where I see people coming to me going, I've been with my boyfriend two years. We haven't had a single fight. People tell me it's not okay. Mm. Wow. So kind of normalize that, huh? You know, the world is just it's crazy. It's crazy on every level. It's really hard. I mean, this generation, my kids, next generation, it's just getting more complicated. And, and I think that we could help change that, but we also need an army of people to come around us to support this. And I think, you know, back to, I really believe like you and like me, I didn't know that I didn't know what I was missing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what a healthy relationship was. And to your point, I have to say, after getting out of this marriage, I still am seeking that. I don't think I've ever experienced it, thought I did, but apparently not. And I do believe once you genuinely get a taste for it, like you have now with your marriage, there is no going back because why would you go back to that train wreck? Yeah. Why? When you have tasted something that's real and healthy, I don't think that you could ever settle again because now you know what the red flags are, you know what green flags are, and you know what decision you need to make to continue. I think that this is like a generational thing. What you have, you pass down. So you're either going to pass down ugly or you're going to pass down good. And you came so far in the fight to say no more. That's exactly what you did. You're like, no freaking more. I'm yeah. done. But the hurdle is going from where you are, which is love is dysfunctional. And I get into dysfunctional relationships because I don't know any better. The hurdle from there to this more loving, more functional relationship is your confidence and faith in yourself that you deserve this and you can have it. What, what was, what had you jump from where you were to where you are? What was what was, was it, was with a specific thought, a specific moment? Well, I mean, it goes back to my faith, really, you know, I'm a woman of faith. And, um, when I realized that my worth wasn't in my upbringing, you know, I wasn't the daughter of a prostitute. I wasn't the daughter of the raging alcoholic. My father was a felon. I mean, he was in the mafia. It's crazy. And I was so shamed by that. And then you know, my identity is not I'm an alcoholic or I'm this sexually immoral woman. Um, it took rock bottom to actually, it was necessary for me to hit rock bottom. The greatest setback, Chantel became my greatest comeback. And I have to say for me as a woman of faith, I'm going to say it was God. Mm -hmm. um, I had like an awakening, if you will. I was desperate. I was suicidal and you know I had this encounter and I do believe in God and and so that's part of my story with my book broken no more um that's where it began that's where the journey began because um I wasn't a Christian growing up my God I was I joke and say you know I married the devil twice <laughs> you know and that's not nice to say but um you know my mother was into witchcraft and tarot yeah you know all this stuff she introduced me to and and so like, I was so confused. I had no idea that, you know, there was more to faith than just like dabbling with like things that really weren't helping our family at all. I saw no victory in what she was doing. So that was my evidence. Like there was no power. She continued this lifestyle of darkness. And, and my mother was bipolar and schizophrenic and you know, my dad died when I was 40, when he was 46, I was 16 years old. I lost my home. I lost everything. And I think that was the turning point for me. I looked at my parents and I looked at that situation and I said, to hell with this, this will not be my story. Right. And so there's like this thing that rises up in you that says, you know, I don't want my tombstone to say defeated. Right. I wanted to say victorious. I wanted to change the game. And there was such a desire in me 
that probably started around 22 years old when I was in the military. I looked at these pilots and I thought, what do they have that I don't have? You know, I'm saluting them. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And they had a degree. For example, they had a degree. I didn't. I was enlisted. There's nothing wrong with either side, but I wanted more. I wanted to know that I could accomplish so much more than what those voices were telling me. So we all have like this internal voice of, I call it the lies of the enemy. You know, you're a whore. You're not good enough. You're an addict. You know, you're a failure. You're never going to amount to anything. And these are the things I actually have been told. You know, there's so much power, Chantel, in what has been spoken over you. So if you're in an abusive relationship and your husband or partner says, you know, you're just like your mother or you're never going to amount to anything, those words take power. And we have to learn to cast those down and replace them with truth. The truth is, I am more than enough. I am worthy, I am loved, and I am lovable. Mm -hmm. And there's a plan and a hope for my life, and you just watch. That's kind of like my, my attitude. I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter, and I don't like to be defeated. And so I'm not only fighting for me, but I'm fighting for others that need help, and my kids, and my future generations. Yeah. You know, the sooner we define ourselves, the, the, the quicker we'll reject what people try to impose on us. Right. Um, it, it's so, it's so important to listen. I, oh my God. Like I'm so I'm, I'm right here right now. I am just beclamped because I'm thinking about myself as a teenager and I'm thinking about the journey that I had between myself and my mom and how my mom would lift me up with one hand and slam me down with the other one. And so you know, at the end of the day, do I have a fundamental self-esteem I must have to have been able to battle against the push down that she did? Because I remember, you know, uh, here I am as, as a teenager, 14, 15, 16, 17, defining myself and my sexuality, Mm -hmm. having boyfriends at 14, breaking up with them after three months, each and every single one of them, because at three months, I would really get the feeling they wanted to go further than I wanted to. And I didn't want the hand on my shirt and I didn't want the hand on my pants. And I wasn't ready for that. And so I would break up with them at three months because I knew they were wanting that eventually. And so me being in charge of my boundaries, my sexuality, here I am at 16, having my first boyfriend, um, the first one that I fall in love with, the first one that I'm keeping. And I'm going, you know what? It's six months in now. I haven't dumped the motherfucker yet. And I'm probably going to be having sex with them because I'm in love with this person. Going to my sister at 16 saying, hey, you know what? I'm thinking about having sex. Can you tell me about your experience? Because she's three and a half years older than me. She says, let's get you on birth control, takes me to the doctor, gets me on birth control. I'm secretly, I think, on birth control because I don't think mom and dad know because my teenage sister took me. Um, actually, apparently my mom had had a conversation with my sister saying, if Chantal comes to you, take care of her in that sense because she might not come to me. So they actually conspired. So here I am 17 years old on birth control, having sex for the first time with my boyfriend, by the way, popped the chair on Valentine's day. Sounds romantic, but it was in a cheap hotel room while all the lights were on and the wizard of Oz was playing on TV. Not quite so romantic, but anyways, but that was my decision, right? Like I went to him on Valentine's day and I, I said to him, I'm ready. And he's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, are you sure? Sure. And I'm like, yep. He goes, are you definitely sure? I'm like, I've been thinking about this. I'm prepared. Yes, I am. So he got a hotel room and we went and did it. Um, but that was me with my sexuality. Now, did I have friends who were male? Yeah, I did. And I hung out with them. So here's my mom watching me have boyfriends, watching me have male friends, not having a single fucking conversation with me about who I am as I navigate all of this, lift me up with one hand, slam me down with the other. I think you're a whore. Basically, I'm paraphrasing what she said. And I remember where we stood when she said that in the stairs at the house, sunshine coming in, and my mom saying to me that she basically believes I'm fucking the town. And I remember how I felt in that moment. I rejected what she was saying wholeheartedly and I was 
furious that she didn't see who I was. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that I just stood strong in my conviction of self, pushed back against the push down, because if I had taken what she said, I would have called myself a whore. Well, and then what, where the mind goes, the man follows. There's so many women I've counseled where those words have been spoken over them, such as myself. And when you believe you're a whore, you act like one, exactly. right? And so that's the, that's the other thing with these women. No, you're not. You are so much more. And I think it boils down to respect because I feel like when we actually have self-respect, we're not willing to give things up on the first few dates. We can have fun if we want to, by the way. And, and I, I want to I wanna stipulate that. My mom was calling me a slut, paraphrasing. She didn't quite say so in those words, but she was saying that because I, I, there's, you know, there's a, even if I was sexually free mm -hmm. and exploring like I did in my 20s, even if I was doing that, then there's nothing wrong with it. The fact that she tried to play that card on me, like it's a bad thing for me to be having sex and making my own selections and making my own decisions about who I'm going to be with, saying that in a negative, like not even asking me what my sexual experiences are, but just trying to paint me in a negative light based on her own misconceptions and judgments. How did that impact you? I mean, this is your podcast, but I want to ask you. No, I love conversation. So your relationship with your mom, yeah. was your mom like a little bit on the narcissist side? Was she emotionally abusive? Yeah. I mean, obviously she was. Yeah. How did that impact you? And is that one of the forces and drives behind your books to say, you know, I'm writing to these women who have experienced what my mother has done to me. Is that part of where that got stirred up? My, my relationship when I left home was an abusive relationship. I basically replaced my mom. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so the, the cycle of abuse is, is so nefarious because listen, it didn't start with my mom. It started with her mom and who knows, who knows what happened to my grandma. I don't know, but something turned my grandma into that monster, which turned my mom into that monster. And it turned me into that monster because not only did I get myself into an abusive relationship, but I myself was also abusive starting at the age of four, no less. I remember I, I got a doll for Christmas. And so I remember age by homes that we lived in because my dad was military. And so we moved around. Right. And so I know that I was five in this house. So the Christmas that I remember in that one, I was four. So I got a doll at four. I remember sitting in the living room by myself after all the gifts were unwrapped, everybody was in the kitchen and I held my doll and I was overcome by a sense of rage. And I mm -hmm. shook my doll in rage. That's the first moment of rage that I remember doing. Here I am in grade one, being abusive to the family pet. Wow. The cycle of abuse had taken hold and I was now not only being abused, but I was also a perpetuator. So that's the effect that this had on me. I chose bad boyfriends. I chose abusive behaviors. As a child, I wasn't choosing them. I was, I was enacting the rage that was developing inside of me. Um, so I'm going to take back the word chose abusive behaviors. Um, I stopped choosing abusive behaviors as an adult. That's when I decided to change and take control of myself and no longer enact this in an uncontrolled way. As an adult, you can choose to do behaviors that make it easy to choose your behavior. So meditation outside of amped up moments means amped up moments are less amped. So then as an adult, I changed my behaviors. But here's another impact that it had growing up in an abusive home. I got my tubes tied because I need to control my environment in order to be the calm person that I am. And you, you know, you have kids, you can't control that environment. No, and they're teenagers and it's even more uncontrollable than ever. <laughs> um, you know, that is, that is one of the stories that um, what you just shared, it's so drastic and radical and it's based on your experience that you chose to tie your tubes. I mean, I've never had anything like that come into my office. I've had other 
things come into my office. And certainly I'm not making this, you know, minimizing this or making this a big deal, but the decision that you made says so much without you saying anything. You have just said so much, Chantel, in that one comment. Have you, did you regret doing this? I mean, I don't know. I think you're a beautiful woman and I think you said how old you were, but I'm certainly not going to guess, but I do know this. You don't look anything like you, I think you said you were not at all. And so (laughs) I don't know if you share your age on this, but I could just tell you that I, (laughs) crazy, this woman is 50 years old. And so, and you know, here's the other thing. We're just gonna, we're just gonna go against everything that says stress ages you and bad environments because you are walking, living proof that it doesn't always age you or turn out bad. Why? because you chose a different path. But, you know, do you regret doing the, like to the woman right now that's listening, who may have done the same thing or decided, you know what, I'm too afraid to have kids. I used to say, I'm never going to have kids because I don't want to mess them up. Mm. I don't want to mess them up because of my background, my trauma. I will mess up these kids. They'll end up in jail. That's what I used to think. But did you say that? Exactly. Same? Exactly. And, and like I, I, I said, listen, I don't know if I can control myself, if I can control myself. And I don't want to experiment on a human being to see if I can control my rage because that's what it is. I have rage inside me. I, I do my live streams and I, I go off on trolls sometimes. because I know. And then, and then people are like, why are you so defensive? I'm like, I'm not defensive. I'm mad that I have to deal with you. Yeah. So yes, I, I have anger issues. And I'm like, all the more reason why you should follow my lead. Bitch has anger issues and hasn't yelled at her husband in seven years. I know what I'm talking about when it comes to being able to be functional in a relationship despite the dysfunction you had before. Right, right. And you know, I have rage too. I'm going to be the first person to tell you about that. I still have what I call trauma brain And I get triggered because I was in a marriage um, for 20 years and there were a lot of secrets. We'll just leave it at that. And so, um, you know, I get triggered in, even in relationships. Now I know that I'm not ready because of my rage. I mean, I'm a Christian woman, but I could be on the flip side. I can be like the devil, just like that. And I'm not afraid to say that because I'm, I'm real. I'm not, I don't present myself as something I'm not. Okay. And so I have rage. My kids, I homeschooled my children. You want to talk about rage? I mean, I, it was because of the military lifestyle. As you know, you were raised in the military. We moved like 15 times in 20 years. And so for me, the best decision was let's just homeschool these kids because if we got to uproot again, it was just a crazy life for us. And, um, you know, I wish I could tell you as a Christian woman that I, have overcome that. And, and no, there is a lot of anger. There's injustice. There's, there's a desire to, to see justice be served. But, you know, one thing I have to remind myself is not vengeance isn't mine. And so I do believe that my rage is a choice. I can either go super postal on somebody and then for what it feels good in the moment, but then what, you know, and then I have regrets. I shouldn't have said that. And so, but it's very much in me, but I do believe it comes from, again, the childhood trauma, what we were uh, exposed to in our environment. And um, it's something for sure that I have to work on. It's not like I'm a raging lunatic, but you know what I'm talking about. It comes, it rises up. And I mean, I could paint somebody's back porch red in two seconds. Yeah. Yeah. I love how you said it comes and it rises up because I'm like, yeah, she knows. Mm. Yeah, it is, it is, and, and, and you, you added the word injustice and it shows me how well you understand where this comes from. Um, you know, the, it's, we understand right and wrong. We understand as babies, as children, when we are being wronged, because we know the people who make us are the people who should protect us. And when those are the people who hurt us, our child brain says, that's not fair. Right, right. So, fair that's not fair that's not fair and then that hurt confusion 
injustice turns into anger that's not fair and that's the rage inside of us is that because anger is a byproduct of hurt and when your child is wounded and hurt by people who should protect us over and over and over and over it becomes a rage my mom has rage she has raged on me i have rage i have raged on weaker and that's what we do isn't it we rage on what is weaker because it doesn't fight back right right back it's so easy so easy to unleash turn that below us into a lightning rod and then oh we pop that pressure bubble after and yeah we like shit about it but what are we going to do about the rage next time and and this is why i cut my tubes because i no, it's going to come up. It still comes up. And I meditate. If I have a child in my home, that is my responsibility that I can't just leave and take space from when I need to calm my shit. It's bad news for the kid. Right, right. You know, one of the things that helped me, um, you know, my mother was just horrible. She locked me out of the house when after my father died within he I always say he wasn't even cold in the grave yet before men were coming in and out and she would lock me out one time I broke in the house and she was laying on the living living room floor with my bedspread with her man from the bar and the man was wearing my dad's jacket wearing his jewelry I mean this is trauma for a kid who just lost her father and, you know, I had a lot of rage towards my mom because she said, you killed your father. My, again, she was schizophrenic and bipolar, ended up homeless. She went missing for over a decade. And one of the most powerful tools that have helped me with my rage is this F word that everyone hates <laughs> and it's forgiveness. Now we have to be clear. A lot of people think forgiveness is reconciliation with your offender. That's not true. Forgiveness is relinquishing your right to seek revenge because that stuff would poison me. And so I forgave her for so many things, Chantel. I mean, the woman abandoned her kids. She locked us out. She chose men over us and I forgave her. Yeah. And so what happened was after I got married, I went in the military, blah, blah, blah. There was this huge gap of, I didn't even know if she was alive. But I made my peace with her without her by saying whether or not she ever asks me to forgive her, I'm choosing to forgive her because I'm going to relinquish this because it's poison to me. Having depression, I'm having anxiety, I'm wanting to drink. I can't allow this woman to have the stronghold on me. She's having power over me because I'm giving her that power. But the moment I wholeheartedly forgave her, It was so crazy because things started to change. Things started to shift. I began to see her as a broken woman, not the woman who was horrendous to me, but I began to empathize. And it took me a little while. It didn't happen right away. I'm just going to be honest. It wasn't like an overnight thing. But once I became a mom, I actually hated her first more because I'm like, lady, how could you have done this to your children? My kids are my life. I'd lay down my life for my children in the blink of an eye and you sacrificed us for yourself. And so once I moved past those damaged emotions and forgave her, I was able to, you know, I went to God with it. I'm like, she was a bitch, you know, she was horrible. She, you know, she chose sex and men and addiction and all these things. And, and I was stroking checks at 16. I was working to her counselor. I was like, mom, I'm going to pay for your counseling. I'm 16 years old. She never asked for a report card, could care less. She wasn't at the birth of my kids, my Air Force graduation. She wasn't at my college. None of that because she was doing her thing. And I get a phone call one day. This is literally after I prayed. I gave it up to God. I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. And I said, I don't know if she's alive or if she's dead, but I forgive her and I give her to you, God. It's too big for me to handle. It's yours. And the moment I did that, I get a phone call from a woman in a shelter. Mind you, I'm from Rhode Island. Okay. My mother ends up in Florida and I get a phone call from a woman who says, out of nowhere, I have your mom. I didn't even know she had children. This is after a decade, like 13 years. In my mind, she was dead. 
This is a woman being resurrected from the dead. I had buried it and was done. And now what do you do? She's back. She's back. And she said, I have your mom. I didn't know that she had children. She's skin and bones. She's in a shelter and she's waving at things that are not there, again, with schizophrenia, and she's drinking rubbing alcohol, and she's been arrested numerous times. My mother apparently had a habit, God bless her, she's in heaven now, but she had this habit of, of going to motel pools swimming naked, I don't know, maybe, I don't know where she got that from. <laughs> that was like the biggest thing she did, she just liked to swim naked, and um, you know, I guess skinny dipping is a thing, it was for me way back when, but I found her, I was reunited, I knew I had to see her, and I did. And I knew for my mental health, I had to forgive her. Yeah. And so the crazy thing about all of this is that it took a massive heart attack. She ended up having a massive heart attack. She wasn't supposed to live. I find her, she comes home back to um, my sister's house, and I get like three more years with her. And in those three years, I never expected this. I sat her down, I brought her to this home right behind me. And I was telling her my story a little bit because she's again, she's not all there. She's had strokes. She's like on her deathbed. And I said, mom, I just want to tell you that this is what you have missed. And this is who I am. And I have this ministry, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, she looked at me like, as in that moment, she was completely like in, had her head back. And she said, I am so sorry. She said, I am so sorry. And she started to cry. I never thought I'd have this healing. I never thought I didn't expect it. I buried it and I was going to be healed anyway. And she said, I'm so sorry I did that to you. And she hugged me. And it wasn't long after that, she ended up having another stroke. And my mom, when she died, it wasn't on the streets. It was, she wasn't homeless. She died in the presence of all five of her kids. And I was so thankful, but I do think, you know, we talk about like manifestation and bringing good vibes and all of that. For me, I believe that my forgiveness allowed the power for that to happen. It doesn't happen for everybody. I get that, but it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't forgave. Right. And so it healed me that day. It closed the wounds. I was going to be healed no matter what, because I chose to forgive, even though I didn't feel like it. See, a lot of us feel like we have to feel good to forgive somebody. No, you have to forgive first to be healed because you may never get that part to them. You may never hear the words you need to hear, but you have to say, you know what? I choose to forgive, even though they did this to me and I surrender it. And so the rage, we go back all the way back to the rage piece. I'm not 100% delivered from rage, but the forgiveness is very essential when I'm working with my clients dealing with rage issues because rage causes panic attacks. There's rage attacks, depression, abuse, suicide, grave. It causes you to go to the grave prematurely. And that's how dangerous this thing is. And we shouldn't minimize it because it's real. I agree. Um, you know, you, like you, you talk about how I look at 50 and, and this is the result of lowering my cortisol levels because cortisol is the stress chemical cortisol and adrenaline, right? This is what you go through when you're in this highly amped situations, fighting with your partner, cortisol, fear, adrenaline, fight or flight. This cocktail in your body is so damaging to you. It literally tears your cells apart and will age you prematurely. And, and I came to terms with my mom by looking at her history, by creating understanding. With I, I like to see with understanding comes compassion. And compassion is the opposite of anger and lack of acceptance and frustration. And so I, I, I wanted to get to that place where I wasn't so angry about what she did to me anymore. And what I did is I went into her history. I went into my dad's history too, because I was mad at him. Why did you let this happen? Why didn't you protect me? I went into both of their histories to understand why my history developed the way it did. My mom was abused sexually, physically, violently, violently, violently abused. And, and so how could she not be that person? 
if she didn't do the work herself, right? right? She carried that anchor and then unleashed it onto me. I was the one who was the lightning rod. Um, my dad, why wasn't he there to protect me? My dad was raised at boarding school. He wasn't parented by his parents. And so he parented the way he knew how, not really quite being there, right? <laughs> because parents weren't a presence in his life. So he didn't know how to be a presence so, so much in mine. And he didn't know, like my mom would say to, to him, you know, you need to punish her more. So I punish her less. Basically she wanted wow. him to spank me. I remember the one time he did, uh, I was in grade four. He's, he put me over his lap and he spanked my butt. Like my mom would spank me with their wooden spoons. And, um, uh, he said that hurt me more than it hurt you. And at grade four, I'm like, yeah, right. But yeah. He, he didn't do that again because he hadn't done it before because he didn't want to. He didn't do it again because he didn't want to. He didn't want to be that person. If he gave me a punishment, it was writing something a hundred times because that was yeah. the least violent thing he could think of. Um, so I looked at my mom, I looked at my dad and I went, okay, I understand. And now I feel compassionate about how they raised me. And I forgave them. I forgave them each and it gave me a whole lot of peace of mind. Right. And, you know, I look back on my own history and my own acts of violence. And do I forgive myself for what I did? I do because I understand it. Do I regret what I did? A million percent. And I see regret as a good emotion because it keeps you from repeating things that you shouldn't. Okay. That's good. You know, last, I wanted to say this regarding the rage thing. Um, you know, this is going to be hard for me to say to you, and I hope you don't take offense. And, and I, I say to my clients, and we do this at my counseling intensives, you know, when a woman comes in, to, I've counseled, I counseled a Playboy centerfold, right? She was in Hugh Hefner's palace, and I've counseled priests, I've counseled CEOs, I've counseled heroin addicts. I had a girl do heroin in my bathroom. You know, um, I had a, a woman show up to one of my uh, events completely intoxicated, but that's who I am. This is what the ministry is for. It's exactly for these types of women and men. And um, I hear you speak and I hear, of course, I would love to go in there, Chantel, little Chantel and rescue you because that's my heart. It's like, oh God, I wish I could just go in there and pick her up and say, it's okay and mother you. And, but what if that's exactly what needed to happen, Chantel? for you to be Chantel Hyde. Oh yeah. I needed to experience those pains so that I would have an assignment mm -hmm. and understand the assignment. I have written thank you letters and I've had the women that have come through my program sit down and I want you to write a thank you letter for the things that you have and the things that you don't have and even the things that you never thought you'd be thankful for. Yeah. It crazy when you sit in that perspective, in that light, because you are who you are and you are unique. Nobody else is you based on what you had to go through. There's no one else like you. There's no one else like me. And I don't want to be normal. I don't want to be some cute blonde that has, does it. I don't trust people, Chantel, who don't limp, who are next to me on the battlefield. This is like military perspective here. If we're going to war, I'm not going to choose the sister over there that's crying over her nails not matching and how they didn't do it right and they didn't match the collar up. I need somebody who's badass woman who has scars from head to toe that says, you know what? I may be limping, but I know how to win this war. And that's what this world needs. They're not going to listen to anybody who can't speak or earn the right to speak into their life. I'm not going to risk. Okay, so you know, I do the church thing, right? Okay, so again, I'm not knocking the church, but it's very difficult for me to listen to a pastor who hasn't gone through hell. You're just quoting the Bible, which again, no disrespect, but the woman over here who's been raped by her dad 200 times, who's been left in a parking lot by her first husband to raise a child single-handedly, who survived breast cancer and has been abused, I'm going to listen to that. Because she has just earned the right to speak into my life. And you know what? I salute that woman. And so when she speaks, you feel it. 
-hmm. because coming from a place that you have to earn. And so there are powerful speakers and then there are speakers that should just maybe read audiobooks or something. But my point, and I'm not trying to be a jerk or an asshole, but <laughs> it's like, you know, there are people who haven't, this is why people get injured when it comes to counseling, when it comes to um, coaching, when it comes to churches and all of that, it's like, you've got to earn the right. Don't, don't throw stones at that woman because she's still stripping. You don't know her damn story. Don't throw stones at that woman for having 10 abortions. You don't know her story. Don't throw stones at the woman who refuses to get married again because she's terrified. Don't do that. There's only, to me, there's only one person, you know, as a Christian that has earned the right to do that. And guess what? He's not doing that. He wins with love. And I think that's the greatest principle for all of us to get on this planet is to love others as, as you have been loved, I think, by God. And when you do that, love wins, but love wins at every level, Chantel. Love is the greatest weapon against the enemy of our lives, against the thoughts, against the actions. Love wins, but it starts with loving you. If you don't love you, how the hell are you going to get other people to love you? If you don't respect you, how are you going to get respect from others? And if you don't believe in you, they ain't going to be believing in you. It starts here, right here. Yeah. What do you see when you look in the mirror? And I throw a mirror in all my clients' face. What do you see? What do you hear? What are the lies you hear? <sighs> I'm old. I'm ugly. I'm fat. I'm a bad mom. I'm a horrible wife. I'm a failure. I'm not good enough. This is the shit that I hear from five-year-olds. Mm. I can't remember. Do you know what that does to me? You talk about rage. You want to see this girl get rageful. How dare these kids get these thoughts when they're five, five. And it does. And you would have had the same ones had I sat you down, little Chantel in a chair and said, honey, what do you see when you look in the mirror? Tell me. You would have been repeating what's been told to you and what you've seen. But there comes a point where you have to replace that with the truth that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, mm. that you do anything, that you're the head and not the tail, that you are so loved and worthy of love. And you know what? If we got our, if we got our mindset to believe the truth, Chantel, and not these bullshit lies, you and I both, even I know, I'm not gonna ask you this question, but I'll just say, I'll put myself out there. Those lies are still here right? I still hear them. If I let them speak to me, I can bow down to them. But you know what? I'm fighting every day, especially after getting divorced. My husband didn't choose me. He chose other things. Right. And so to not be chosen by mom, to not be chosen by dad, and then to not be chosen by the very man who made these promises and led me to God, by the way, and throw that piece in, is, is traumatizing. I have to remember who I am and not let that define me. And if you and I and other like-minded women would truly, truly believe the truth about who we are, we would change the world. We literally could change the world. And I want to be a world changer. I know you do too. You want to be writing all those books. Yeah. You want something. You have the heart to help. And that's why we need sisters like you on the front lines yeah, we're limping, but you know what? We don't trust nobody up here without no limp. It's revolution time. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Lock yeah. and loaded. Time to fire our weapons. Locked and loaded. I wouldn't change a thing about my past. I get that question a lot on my live streams. What would you tell your 16-year-old self? What would you yeah. tell your 20-year-old self? And I know what they're asking for is, what would you say to change your journey and make it better? And, you know, what piece, in a way, it's like, what piece of advice are you, are you giving me right now, right? And I'm happy to change people's journeys, but I wouldn't change mine. I wouldn't change what I experienced, even though sometimes it was absolutely terrifying. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even take away any of those moments because it made me into who I am, which is a powerhouse as a life coach because all these different situations that I experienced from divorce 
to being abused as a child, all of them gave me the ability to guide you through yours because I can't sit here as an expert in anything that I haven't been through. Right. So it, it makes me a better coach and I want to be a good coach because at the end of the day, I think, I think the reason why my tubes are tied is so that I can be a mama to all the people who need me. Because if I have babies of my own, I wouldn't have time to do this. Well, you know what? Again, Jesus was not a biological father, but you know, he's the father to all. And, and you don't have to have children to be a mother. You don't have to have children to be a father. And we need women to raise the younger generation. You know, I have these teenagers that are self-harming and attempted suicide. What if? What if this? What if they didn't let that that stuff that you and I have drank for so long define them? It starts now. So that's motherly, right? To say, no, honey, that's not the way to go. Let me tell you who you are. It's not about what dad said you are. It's not what about, about what that boyfriend did to you or that rape or whatever. You are not those things. But if you allow yourself to get well, you can use the very thing that was meant to harm your life and destroy you to save lives. Imagine that. The very thing that was meant to destroy your life is the very thing that will be used to save lives. That's the change for them. They're like, wait a minute. You mean I could use this for good? Yes. Yes, you can. It's either going to be used in vanity, in vain, or it's going to be used for good. Mm -hmm. My goodness, my phone just said low battery and I am not plugged in. <laughs> it's all on my love. You know, I'm going to answer one quick question and we'll wrap this up because it's been, it's been an hour and I try to keep it to an hour for many people because I know people, you know, we, we have so much, we have so much attention span. You asked where all this came from and the word compelled is where it all came from. I have been guided my entire life. Even my pain has been part of my guidance because my outcome is all of it. I am here for a reason. I wrote a book called Custom Made. I think from the moment I was born, I've been custom made to be the person I am today. And the universe, God, said to me five years or so, I don't know exactly when, but about five years feels about right. It said, there's a book inside of you. And I was still a stripper. I hadn't even conceived of changing careers yet. I was on, I, I was just rolling along going, what? There's a book. I don't, what are you talking about? And then I wrote my first seminar. Like I said to myself, okay, I'm 40 aging out of stripping. What am I going to do next? Answer the question by saying, what is it that I'm already doing that I love to do? Branded the fact that I was already giving advice, which is what I love to do. Yeah. I just branded it. And I wrote my first seminar. And the first seminar became my first book, No More Assholes. And the un God, I'll say God, right? And it was just like, there's more, there's more, there's more. And it was pushing me like a freight train. It was incredible. So God is yeah. what had me doing what it is that I'm doing because it guided me from day one, showing me the things I needed to learn so I could teach them to the people I needed to teach. I'm so glad you are here. I'm so glad you are teaching right alongside me getting this word out that yes. self-love is where it starts that's right and you know what we're gonna say god i'm gonna give credit to god for that there's a book in you there's a book in me and there's still more books to be written right and it's not just us as the authors it's those who are listening right now i feel like there are people that are being prompted right now to even get their story out to be encouraged to use their pain for good there's purpose in all of that. And I thank you so much for your podcast because whoever's listening, I know has been touched and inspired by what you're doing. So thank you. We love and appreciate you so much. Where can we find you, Marianne? Brokennomore.com. Just love it. Sad. Everything's on there, brokennomore.com. If people want a copy of my book, we even have t-shirts for crying out loud, um, or they can have individual counseling sessions with me. So thank you. And is it toxic no more on TikTok? Toxic. Oh, that's right. TikTok. Toxic. No more. Twenty two for this year. Twenty two. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chantel. It's been an honor to meet you and talk to you. I love your books, and I'm going to be leading group tonight, actually, at seven o'clock with some of your material. So 
Oh, I love this. I love this. Thank you. I appreciate you so, so much. Can't even say that enough. Thank you so much for being a war hero, girl. We need uh -huh. you. Thank you, you for that, Marianne. Bye. Bye.